views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey everyone, how are you? Hope you're doing well. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee. Welcome to BXRX. We have another fantastic show lined up for you today. Coming up on today's show, we'll speak to the representative of a youth organization to learn about their program's involvement with the Bronx Public Garden. Then we'll hear from a Bronx singer who will speak about how she's doing the, her part in keeping her friends and family safe during this pandemic. After that, we'll speak to the representatives of an organization about a partnership that will bring about opportunities within our community. Then my man Bobby C has the latest in the world of sports. And then lastly, we'll speak to the representative of an organization working on a project that will support low income families. So stay tuned. In fact, you can kick off your shoes and relax your feet because we are wide open. Welcome. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Lee, and uh, you're watching Open. It's a live interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. Now, you can uh, stay connected to us through social media at BronxNet TV. Leading things off, our first guest is the Senior Manager of Youth Programs at Wave Hill Public Garden and Cultural Center. He joins the program today to speak about the many youth internships the garden has to offer. So please welcome to the show, Barry. Kogan. Thank you, Bob. Barry, tell us about the Museum Without Walls. Um, well, Wave Hill is a wonderful place, a special place. I have um, worked here for um, almost 10 years now, and um, we are all the way in the northwest corner of the Bronx. We overlook the Hudson, um, mm -hmm. and there's a lot going on. There's a lot of different programs that we have for different audiences. Um, I work with our youth programs. And I'm here to tell you about our Worm and Forest Project program and can also answer a few questions about some of our other um, internship programs. You know, as a garden, we grow plants, but we also really, you know, grow people too. It's a place that um, lots of careers move along in different ways. And uh, we're really proud of that. Now, you said Worm and what project? The Worm and Forest Project. The Worm tell us program. About that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, um, for over 40 years, Wave Hill has been involved with ecological restoration in New York City. Um, New York City, as you may know, has a really amazing amount of natural areas, about 10,000 acres of forested areas around the five boroughs. Yeah. The Bronx in particular, I think my, it's definitely my favorite borough from a green perspective. And except for Wave Hill and our neighbor Riverdale Park, we've got then Cortland Park, we've got the old growth forest at the New York Botanical Gardens. We got Palm Bay Park. We have Seton Falls Park, um, a slew of amazing parks in the South Bronx. Um, so we, so our job, um, we essentially create programming that um, focuses on the hard work of the ecological restoration practitioners, the activists, the community organizers, the many nonprofits that do work to make sure that these spaces exist. Um, and uh, we create internships. But the worm, but the yes. worm plays a very, very important part. It's an integral part of the program. Tell us about it. Yes, yes. So our worm students, um, it's a 14 month internship program and um, students start with us one summer. So if you are applying right now and you're interested in this program, you will be with us starting next summer and um, or this summer. And um, you, we will, you will start off by taking two college level courses and um, also just learning a little bit about our woodlands. At Wave Hill, we have eight acres, a small forested area that has been taking care of high school students for about 40 oh. years. And um, you will learn about that forest. You will take college level courses in GIS mapping and um, in ecological restoration, just learning basic ecology and some of the history of New York City that I was just talking about. And then um, you would meet with us every single Saturday during the school year with 
um, we'll, we will explore the Bronx, we will explore some natural areas around New York City. And kind of the big payoff at the end of this long experience is for your second summer with us, you would work with a local scientist and help them with their research. I so, like it. So how did they name it the Worm Forest and Forest Project? So um, let me start with WORM. The WORM is a newer program. We started about eight years ago and it stands for Woodland Ecology Research Mentorship. So that oh, is- Oh, you know that. what I, when you first mentioned it, I thought you were actually working with the WORM because it goes into the earth and creates the oxygen, you know, it's a part of the whole situation, you know? Yeah, yeah, fun aside, um, <laughs> earthworms are actually not native to our ecosystems. So um, they're actually, Rather than working with them, they are an issue that local researchers are trying to address. Really? And, uh, okay. Yeah. We took a chance naming our worm program, um, <laughs> but it leads to good conversations and it's a great way to have students start thinking about ecosystems and how yeah. there's a lot of things we don't realize about what it takes to have a healthy ecosystem. Yes. So you have this wonderful internship program. How, how, do you, how does one get involved in it? So we are set to launch our application um, any moment. Um, there will be access um, on our website. Um, there's an online application that all students need to apply. And yeah. the form program is for students that are currently in the ninth, 10th and 11th grade. Gotcha, okay. And how's it, how was it navigating through um, this pandemic? Uh, how have you guys fared thus far? Um, thank you for asking. Um, it has definitely been a challenge, but also a really rewarding experience. Our students, um, you know, I can't say enough about the hard work they put in. Um, so we had a graduating group of students that finished their yeah. program last summer. Um, and those students found a way to work with their mentors to still create amazing final research projects that showcased all their hard work, but adjusted for COVID in unique ways. Some of the groups were even able to um, put the COVID situation into their research. One group looked at parks accessibility issues in New York City um, yeah. for different communities. Um, and uh, together with their mentor, um, really were able to think about what are some barriers um, to engagement with natural spaces, with nature. So kind of our mission um, was achieved by these students thinking about all this. Wow, we have to get to some cameras out there and run through the woods with you. I'm really a nature boy at heart. <laughs> <laughs> I love stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, we're um, definitely open to the public um, yeah. and it's always a great place to visit. And once we're back with our students, we would love to have you come out. Um, we can put you to work doing restoration work in our forest. Sounds like you'd enjoy that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where can people go to learn more about the Wave Hill and apply to the youth programs? So we have a website for each of our youth programs. So I talked a bit, a bit about the WARM program. We also have the Forest Project program and our ACES program, which is a little bit different. Um, and um, we have a youth, a youth internships page on our website that provides updates. Um, two of the applications should go live probably mm -hmm. next week. And the other one will be live later um, this probably early spring. Give us uh, the website where we can go and check it out. So it's wavehill.org and there's yep. a section for education and youth internships and that should provide you links for all three programs. Barry, thank you so much for hanging out with us. You're always welcome to come back, okay? Barry Cogan, he's a senior manager of youth programs and uh, woodland initiatives. He's at the Wave Hill Public Gardens and Cultural Center. Barry, we appreciate you, we love you, God bless you. We'll take a break right here. I've got more, more open coming up next. Welcome, welcome back. I'm the Doc Bob Lee for 107.5 WBLS in Bronx Nets Open. Hey, listen, our next guest is the mezzo-soprano opera singer, as well as a voice and piano teacher. She joins us to speak about how the pandemic has impacted her ability to do what she loves. So please welcome to the show, Linda Calazzo. Linda, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you for having me. 
Oh, I see you have a piano in the back. Are you going to play some music for us or something? I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I'm pretty rough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So tell us about this elastic and luxurious voice that you have. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, I sing opera. I, I started singing opera by by chance. I uh, auditioned for Fiora Lewis LaGuardia High School when I was 13, and I got in for singing. And since then, I mean, LaGuardia High School requires that everyone studies classical repertoire and art song and opera. Yeah. And so I just realized I could sing and the teachers really supported me. They gave me a lot of awards and scholarships and really pushed me. And so eventually I just was kind of like, all right, I guess I got to study this for college because it's something special to me and it's something I, I can do well. And then it just uh, took off from there and I've been performing ever since. But in the area of mezzo soprano? Yeah. So mezzo soprano means medium soprano. Mezzo means medium in Italian. Uh, and it just hey, means... mezzo, hey. Yeah, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah, it just means that like my voice, it's not super high. It can get high, but it's more comfortable in the middle um, yeah, area, yeah. and that it's it's kind of rich and full, and it, it has like a a dark sound. Yeah, I, I can hear your speaking voice. I like that too. It's, <laughs> a, it's, it's nice to listen to. How has the pandemic impacted your ability to perform and collaborate with the other artists and singers? Um, I'm not gonna lie; it's been really, really hard. Um, I've been able to get by. Um, I've been fortunate enough to get a couple of gigs here and there virtually and one in person where I had to wear a mask the whole time and the, the mic was underneath the mask. Yeah. Um, virtually, it's been very challenging. Um, for example, you know, I, as, an, as a singer before COVID, I would typically always work with a pianist and a accompanist. Um, someone that I would go to their house for rehearsal, or I would go rent a space in Manhattan for rehearsal. Uh -huh. It's no longer like that anymore because of the pandemic. And um, I've, I've had to use my phone and a stereo instead to play accompaniment, like, like a karaoke track in order to, to perform. And for opera, that's a little bit complicated and difficult. Um, so that has been um, a big, uh, a big inhibition for me it's, it, it prevents me from fully performing like with as much uh engagement as i used to not not being able to perform in front of an audience a, a live in-person audience has also been um hard because that's a really important part to to performing in general and and to me to feel what the audience is feeling to see their engagement to um to interact with them when i perform um yeah it's been it's been hard, but I'm fortunate enough that I've still been able to perform and, and figure this out. I just hope that um, with the vaccine, like eventually we will be able to have performances as frequently as yeah. we do. Are you going to take the vaccine? I already did. So oh. I took the first dose. Yeah, I, I since I'm a teacher, um, I was able to get it. I qualify as like in the one B category. You're a frontline worker. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was able to schedule an appointment for Yankee Stadium and I went, I think, on Monday. So it's been about like four days and I, it's just my first dose. My second dose is March 1st. Um, and I just got very, very lucky because before going to Yankee Stadium, I had tried scheduling in other places in the Bronx and they were canceled. Like I scheduled an appointment for a place yeah. really close to my house and it was canceled because of the shortage. So um, it was just really nice to just be able to go and get the first dose. And I, I, I scheduled it as soon as it was released that Yankee Stadium was opening as a COVID vaccination center. Yeah. Did they tell you which one you were taking, Pfizer or Moderna? The Pfizer. The Yankee Pfizer? Stadium provides the Pfizer, yeah. Yeah, and how did you feel afterwards? Um, There were a couple of symptoms, but they weren't super uh, intense. One was the my arm really, really hurt. I got it in this arm, I saw the Band-Aid. Yeah. Um, it really, really hurt. Like I, I like to sleep on this side, the shoulder, and I couldn't do that because yeah. it was so painful um, on the bed. And um, I, I think another one was exhaustion. Like I was, for example, yesterday, I was really, really tired. And yeah. the nurse told me, the nurse who, who gave me the, the vaccine told me, she was like, you might feel really tired. So um, that was one of the, I think that was one of the symptoms I had yesterday. Yeah. But other than that, it's, I've been wipe my to... eyes. It looks like your your face is changing. With <laughs> oh, it's like 
No, it's not doing that. <laughs> Turning into an alien. <laughs> no, but that's that's great. So you're scheduled to take the second one. Mm -hmm. And um, from then, they, you still have to wear a mask and everything. That's what they tell yeah, us. Of yeah, course. Because yeah. you can still get it and give it, but it just won't send you to the hospital. Right. But you can send others to the hospital. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. I've read about that. Um, so I'm obviously when I'm not home, I try to wear a mask as much as I can. But it didn't affect your voice, though. No, and fu funny enough, um, the day that I got the vaccine, I had a gig in the evening for my oh, no. my queens. Yeah, my my. But old... it made you worry about it, right? What's this thing? Yeah, I was I was kind of like, oh my god, like what if I'm really tired for the performance? <laughs> yeah, and it went fine, and 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 I ended up like putting it on my social media, like I I did a fine performance, and I had my vaccine the same day. It's not a big yeah, deal. Yeah. I was okay. It didn't change your voice. It didn't do anything. Yeah, it didn't hinder no, your. It didn't do your anything. Ability to sing. Yeah. What did you in the performance? What did you sing? I sang mm -hmm. uh, "Cruda Sorte" by Rossini, and I sang the re the really popular aria "Abanera" by um, Bizet from Carmen. Can you so, touch us with the aria "Abanera"? Okay. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Oh, Very good. Okay. Beautiful voice. It's exactly what they say. You have the, the elastic and luxurious voice. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. Where do we go from here? Can we get some CDs out or do you have a CD out? That um, I, I was fortunate enough before COVID to do my first professional recording. Um, and it was with the Mimesis Ensemble, which is located in Manhattan. So I mm -hmm. do have um, one album that I'm a part of one track um, and it's on the Mimesis Ensemble website to purchase. Uh -huh. um, I think it's called, the album is called Dancing Circles in the Night um, and you can purchase a copy at mimesisensemble.org. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's fantastic. Wonderful voice. Go ahead. We applaud you all day, every day, 24 hours a day. Yay. <laughs> I just made Thank that. you. But really, great. What do you tell other people about the, the vaccine? Um, because a lot of people have second thoughts and they want to see, I'm going to follow you to see if you're going to get sick and things of that nature. I mean, I'm just very um, transparent about the symptoms or the side effects I've received so far. Um, how I feel, you know, I just, I'm just trying to be as transparent as I can. Like social media is, can be pretty powerful in that sense where like before I got the vaccine, I was seeing the other essential workers that I'm friends with and the other colleagues and peers that I know post about their process, what the symptoms were like. And that kind of made me less afraid because I was afraid too. Yeah. I was very, very scared. Um, so when I tell, when I talk to someone about the vaccine, I just tell them like, Hey, I, I took it and it really wasn't that bad. Um, like for example, yesterday I was having a conversation with a student. She was saying, I'm really afraid of needles. I'm really afraid of the side effects that like, um, cause she felt that she was at risk of getting a side of a serious side effect. And I just told her, I was like, it, it really wasn't that bad for me. I mean, I'll keep you posted. Uh -huh. Um, I, I never try to force people because it's a personal decision at the end of the day. Um, but I do tell them that I did my own research before getting it because I was scared. Um, I did my own research. I spoke to people who, who had gotten it. Um, and I think the biggest thing that made me ha like get it was that there was kind of no, no time to think. Um, unfortunately, the vaccinations, the, the scheduled appointments were taken so fast that I, just, yeah. I had to just do it if I really wanted it, because um, if I had, if I spent time thinking, then I wouldn't have gotten the appointment. Oh, good. Where can we come down and, and watch you sing? You have anything coming up? Um, unfortunately, no. My my gigs at right now are private. I'm I'm performing for Princeton University on Friday for um, virtually, their, right? Yeah, their youth program, but that is a private um, performance. 
Um, but you can definitely watch me on, on YouTube. Um, just look up Linda Colazzo Mezzo Soprano. You can follow me on Facebook. Just look up Linda Colazzo Mezzo Soprano on Instagram. My, um, IG handle is Linda Ritza, R-I-T-Z-A. Okay. And, um, I do have a, a future performance coming up. That's, that was already pre-recorded with the Metropolitan uh -huh. Opera Guild. So that should be released soon on their Facebook page and Instagram, I believe. So um, definitely check that out. That that performance was in particular very special because I get I got to speak about Latin American music in opera and I got yeah. to perform an Ecuadorian piece. I'm half Ecuadorian. Um, that's like really near and dear to my heart. And um, I got to speak about it and sing the, the half piece. Ecuadorian and half Italian. No, so I'm half Ecuadorian, half Puerto Rican. My, oh, last, okay. name, my last name is, I guess, yeah, it's it's pretty Italian, um, but I, it's it's actually a Puerto Rican last name. Like a lot of apparently, it's a little bit more common in Puerto Rico to hear Colazo. In Spanish, we say Collazo. Um, yes. Yeah, or you can say Collazo. Like there are many different ways to say to say my last name, but Colazo is the easiest way. Um, and and yeah, I'm fully I'm fully Latina. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today. You're very, very pleasant. You have a wonderful voice and we really, really appreciate you. You have to come back. Of course. Yeah, I'm more than happy to um, yeah. come back. Especially when we open up our studios, you have to come back and do a live performance for us. That would be oh, so I would much. love to do that. I would love to do that. Yeah. Well, that would be fun. You are invited. You're always welcome. Okay. Oh, thank and, you so much. And good luck in everything that you're doing. And God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Linda Calazzo, she's Linda Calazzo, the mezzo soprano voice and piano teacher. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we'll take a break. I've got more next. Doc Bob Lee from 107.5 in Bronx Nets Open. Our next guest, our steering committee members of Community Board 4. They join us to speak about the, the Jerome Avenue Revitalization Collaborative and how it's seeking to create inclusive economic growth and sustainability for a community impacted by neighborhood rezoning. You know, that's never really too cool. Welcome to the show, Paul Phelps and Tiarina Ana Sanchez. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank yeah. you. We really appreciate you having us. Great you guys have been around doing some great things for some time now, right? 
but uh, you're opening this up. Tell us about it. That's right. Um, so, so thank you again for, for having us. We are so, so excited. We're thrilled to be launching the Jerome Avenue Revitalization Collaborative, which as you said, was born out of the Jerome Avenue rezoning, the largest in New York City's history. The largest rezoning in New York City's history happened right here in the Bronx. It spanned three community districts, Community Board 4, Community Board 5, and Community Board 7, and it was 93 blocks. So as we yeah. were as a community uh, negotiating and having conversations about this rezoning, we that was where the idea was born to have the Jerome Avenue Revitalization Collaborative yeah. that would be driving inclusive growth. Yeah, and what neighborhoods, uh, this includes how many, what neighborhoods, Paul? Uh, so we have, so we have East Concourse, the Grand Concourse, it includes High Bridge, Mount Hope, Farini, help me out on board five. I'm the, I'm the DM for board four, so I know mine by heart. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So that's four. And then in five, we have uh, Morris Heights, uh, University Heights, getting all the way up to Fordham Road. Now, how cool is that to have all of these communities moving together in the same direction for a common cause? I mean, it, it's fantastic. I mean, we have been working on this for over two years, and I just had a conversation with someone this morning. What I love about this is that this is uh -huh. organic. Everyone is doing this out of their love and passion for the work that we do. Everyone else has full-time jobs doing something else, but this is something that everybody really believes in and thinks that is important. So that's why we've been working so hard to get this up and running and why we're so excited that it's going to be launching in just two weeks. Now... Carolina, you've been working with the Obama administration and also the mayor's office. So you have some great experience in putting a lot of this stuff together and working with wonderful people in the community. Yeah, no, th thank you. That's that's right. I mean, I think for, for me, one of the biggest takeaways that I've had in, in the many experiences that I've had is the importance of partnerships is the importance of community and empowering all of the players at the table. So in the in the JARC, as we call it, JARC, we got to launch a JARC. Oh, watch out. <laughs> She's been <laughs> practicing that. She's been know, practicing that. Yes, yes. She has a yes. dance and everything ready to go. <laughs> yes, yes. Really excited. Do your dance. Do your dance. <laughs> it goes like this. It goes, we going to launch a JARC. We going to launch a JARC. <laughs> <laughs> 80, 80 community organizations are a part of this collaborative and it's it's really incredible to see us come together like this for the, uh, the common cause so paul shock week dark week yes so we are so we are doing our soft launch will be social media next week uh so you can find us on uh facebook at facebook.com uh -huh. forward slash jark bx you can find us on uh instagram at jark bx JeromeAvenue.org, and you can also email us at jarkbx at gmail.com. And in the week of the 22nd, we have three great events. The first is going to be on Tuesday, February 23rd at 10 uh -huh. a.m. That's the Jark uh, Stakeholder Town Hall. The second event is going to be a pay, uh, PPP program, Payroll Protection Program panel. Um, and that's going to be Wednesday, February 24th at 10 a.m. And then, drum roll, please, the creme de la creme is the Bronx Borough President Candidate Forum. And that's gonna be Thursday, February 25th at 6 p.m. And uh, everything that we're doing is really focused on our core mission, which is really about inclusive economic growth. So we're really looking at our core competencies, which are employer-facing job placement, um, uh, business research and service hubs, and then grants for low-income residents along the corridor. So every, and, those are our three core competencies uh, that really uh, drive into our mission. And how, you guys, how are you guys preparing for this? Uh, we are having multiple, this is uh, probably the, it's Thursday, I've seen Perina probably 10 times already this week. <laughs> we are doing prep meetings, we're meeting with the steering committee, we're looking, we're assigning tasks uh, for each and every event down to people muting the buttons at Zoom, so we are working fast and furious to get everything up and running. Um, but it's been fantastic, everybody's really rolling up their sleeves, and they're, we're getting it done. I said shock week, but you knew exactly what I was talking about. I knew, I knew what you meant. We kind of, <laughs> kind of played on it. I, you know, we, I was like, you know, they have a shark week. We're gonna do a jark week. Yeah, we played with it. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> That's great. Man. Seems like you guys work well together. And we do. Uh, you we, guys we do. working we, well together. Same we here. do. I mean, so so we have a little bit of history. So Perina was a board member at Board Five. So we actually worked together 
um, on the recommendations, the community board recommendations for the very end of the EULA process for the board. So we worked very closely together. I know her from RPA. Uh, we have a great rapport. She is fantastic as a community resident, super smart, super personable, fantastic. And I, I enjoy working with her greatly. Wow, it seems like she's gonna be running for something soon. <laughs> I, I i have to say that that all of those things apply to paul and uh you are you are just so incredible to work with uh all of these years since the rezoning and, yeah. and you know we have partners from bronx community college we have partners from wedco there's 15 members on the steering committee and it's it's just i call it the dream team because it's so many uh, people who just really care and they're awesome folks oh they would love for you to mention their names who are they <laughs> Sure. Th let, let's see a, a pop quiz as I think through this. So, so community boards four and five, we have the SOBRO, uh, B-O-E-D-C, the Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation. We have uh, WEDCO, as I mentioned, Davidson Community Center. Uh, we have the BJT Bronx Merchant Association, which is Burnside Jerome Tremont Merchant Association. We have Meta Bronx. We have Bronx Cooperative Development In Initiative, uh, the United Auto Merchants Association, and the HOPE program. Oh, wait, wait, one more. Of course, the Bronx Chamber of Commerce. Yes. There you go. You got everybody <laughs> in there? <laughs> I, I think so. I think so. Shout out to all of the partners. It's it's amazing to, to work with you all. Yeah. And then you have some people, some individuals working with you to help make it happen. Exactly. With exactly. Yes, so so we're working with Jobs First, uh, who has been incubating us, um, and actually the the staff member who's been with us since the beginning was Diana Torres. Uh, this is she was born and raised in this community as well, so she really you know held our hands as as we kind of brought all the partners together, mm -hmm. um, and and has really driven us to to this point where we are today. Paul, you're from Queens, right? I am, I'm, but I'm a raised in Queens, but I've been in the Bronx now for ten years, so. Um, I know You're the Bronx neighborhood side. well. I actually live in the district um, and live in the area now for 10 years. So I know the neighborhood well. And I think for me, so one of the things that's really great about this is that I used to work at the Department of City Planning. So I was, I was so this sort of incubated there. I started on that side. And then the great part was really yeah. coming over to the board in 2016 to help them kind of finish, finish it off and making sure that the community and the board really put forth recommendations that benefited other residents short term and long term. Sounds like great harmony in action. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I'm from Queens too. That's why I mentioned that. And I just saw oh, what part? What it popped part? up on my screen, the screen that you were from Queens. And but you know, we, we're in the Bronx so much that we're like Bronxites. It's okay. Exactly exactly. It's, it's like it's you know it's it's kind of a second nature for me. So yeah, yeah. I welcome you. We welcome you. <laughs> well thank you, thank you, thank you. Um speak more about the borough presence uh forum and the the events that are coming up. Um, so, so the events that are coming up. So the first event is really, it's an opportunity for us to really, as a partnership. Now, again, we have all been working together as a group, you know, the steering committee and the 70, the 70 plus members of JARC, but no one really knows who we are. So this is an opportunity for us to, for people to know who we are, to showcase some of the work that we've done. And even though we're formally launching in two weeks, we have been doing a lot of this work. We've been doing the training. A lot of our partners have been doing a lot of work, particularly during COVID on the PPP side. Uh, you know, we've been, Perinha and a, a group of very smart, uh, talented and very dedicated people have been working to make sure that banking was important and stayed along the Burnside corridor, which is really important. Uh, and then education and training. So we've been doing all those things. So it's an opportunity for us to showcase all of our partners, all the talent that we have across the board and really show our dedication and also show what we can bring to the community at large. That's both for small businesses as well as for residents. Um, and then the second event, as I said, is focused on the PPP. And that's really important. You know, I think as everybody knows, we were the last in terms of the boroughs in terms of percentage and the money that was released to us in terms of PPP. Yeah. And that really, you know, from our perspective is kind of shameful. So we really need to work harder to make sure that our small businesses are getting a larger piece of the pie. Um, you know, we've been devastated by COVID. So we are really working hard to make sure that our small businesses and small business owners uh, know how to apply for PPP and that they're getting their fair share. Uh, and then the last one, the borough president town hall is really important because whoever decides to be the next borough president, uh, they're gonna have a they have a they have a they have a large task at hand. So the work cut out for them. We want to talk to them and see, yeah, exactly. So we want to talk to them to see. So you know, we're about inclusive economic growth. You know, we know that unemployment is extremely high. 
small businesses are closing. So what are your plans to work with our organization, help small businesses? How are you going to help unemployment? Where are you going to focus industry-wise? And what might you be doing in terms of funding or programming to help uh, not only small businesses, but area residents get back on their feet? That's great, man. We love what you guys are doing. You know, you're always welcome to come back here and share. Thank you. Thank we you are, so we greatly appreciate it. Uh, we're, we're very excited. Uh, we want people to come and learn about, you know, again, you know, they can definitely go to our website, uh, jarkbx.com. They can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm not a tweeter, but you can tweet us. Someone else will be doing it. Um, but we, uh, we encourage people to email us, find out about the organization. Um, there's a lot to really learn. I think we're bringing a lot to the table. And as Farina said when she did her little dance, we are really, really, really excited. We've been working for two plus years on this, and we're now about to like we're now about to, to launch this uh, great initiative. So we're super excited. Well, we love what you guys are doing. The Jerome Avenue Revitalization Collaborative Week and Jock Week. I'm gonna say Shark Jock Week. Week. Yes. Yeah, Jock <laughs> Week in full effect Jock. going on right now. Farina, because she has that dance going. Good. Take us out with that dance. <laughs> we gonna launch the jock. We gonna uh, launch, launch the jock. The jock. <laughs> <laughs> That's our exercise for the morning, but we have to continue this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you guys yes, so much. We do. We must. Carolina, thank you so much. We love you guys. Thank, thank you, Bob. We greatly appreciate you having us on the show. Uh, be safe and be well. We really appreciate it. You're always it. welcome. All right. Thank you. We'll thank take you. a break right here, but the, stay tuned because I, I have somebody special coming up. His name is Bobby C. He has the latest in the world of sports. Next. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. Sportscasting legend of more than 40 years on radio and TV, Sal Marciano joins us this morning. Sal, I'm hoping that you can bring some of that great Florida weather here to New York, because right now it's been a rough winter here so far. Well, it's quite delightful here, and I, I hate to rub it in, Bobby. <laughs> Definitely uh, a lot of snow here on the ground and the Big Apple, but we're hoping that instead of talking some weather with us this morning, you can talk some sports. You know, Okay. In my rearview mirror, you speak about how the legends of yesteryear were just different than the stars of today. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, going back to the 60s and 70s specifically, it was the age before the gossip industry developed. Um, um, newspapers and their reporters did only, only wrote about the games. Uh, I'll tell you a, qu a quickie. Uh, uh, Whitey Ford, uh, uh, I had a scheduled interview with him, and on that day there was a picture of A-Rod a on the front page with a woman that wasn't his wife. And uh, there was quite a, a bit of a, attention paid to it. So I said to, I said to Whitey off camera, I said, uh, what, what was it like back in your day? And he said, he said, when we came out of joints, meaning bars and saloons, he said the photographers lowered their cameras because our pictures are only taken with our uniforms on at the ballpark. 
that, that indicates to, sh to show you that they were celebrities in sport, but they weren't celebrities in the, in the, uh, this, this developing gossip industry. And, uh, and that changed, that changed in, in, the, in the late 60s. Now, Sal, you covered it all. So the World Series, Super Bowl, NBA Finals, Stanley Cup championship fights. You hosted ABC's Wide World of Sports before the Thriller in Manila. You interviewed all the greats, Rocky Marciano, Muhammad Ali, Vince Lombardi, Joe Namath, Joe DiMaggio, Hank Aaron, Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays. The list just goes on and on. For you, is there one personality and one story that stands out above the rest? Yes, it, it was. Uh, I, I think that the, the top of the list is Muhammad Ali because of uh, he, he was so charismatic and uh, and so uh, uh, news making all the time. And he, he knew how to use the media. Uh, and uh, my my best story was that uh, uh, the night he lost to Leon Spinks in, uh, in 1978, February 15th at the Las Vegas Hilton. Uh, Ali didn't come to the news conference, so I took my film crew and I knocked on his door up in his suite. And Pat Patterson, his security guy, uh, who I knew and he knew me, I said I'd like to interview him. So uh, he said, "Let me ask him." And uh, the uh, Pat, Pat came back and he said, "The chair." He says, he, "You can come in." And uh, I went in, and, and Ali, we sat on the couch. He was still wearing his ring robe. And we did the interview. And uh, I began by calling him the former world champion. And he, you know, he was so smart. He, he picked up on it right away. And he, he used it as a chant. Damn, I'm the former. I'm the former. And he kept repeating it over and over again during the interview. And it was, uh, the, the, the interview was exclusive. It was on Good Morning America and World News Tonight. And, uh, uh, I remember that specifically as the biggest scoop I ever had. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, it's been tough being a sports reporter these days here in the Big Apple, not like uh, the glory days when you were doing this because, you know, championships have certainly been hard to come by here in the Big Apple. Yeah, I, I was fortunate in that period. I was a sports reporter for Channel 2, uh, and uh, uh, in 17 months, there were three first-time championships. The Jets in January of 69, in October, the Mets, and the following May, the Knicks. And, uh, it, you know, sports went from back page to front page during that period. You know, yes. Sal, I want to talk to you a little bit more about your career. I know you were mentored by another New York City sports casting legend, Marty Glickman. What did Marty mean to your career? He meant a whole lot. I met him when I was 17. And uh, and then I worked with him at uh, WMGM, which was 10:50 a.m. And they did the uh, the Knicks and the Rangers, and they did the Yankee games at that time. And I worked with him, and he, he taught me so much. And he was uh, the time I was going to Fordham, he he was very patient. He listened to my tapes. He was very gracious with his advice, and he was ver very honest. He'd tell you straight out what what you needed to do. And he, he guided me at that point. And when I graduated Fordham, uh, he helped me get my first job as a, uh, at WCBS Radio as what they called a desk assistant. That was a, what a newspaper's copy boy was. And that I, I got in the walls of CBS and everything happened after that. Marty and I didn't have any, anything to do professionally after that, except I, I certainly interviewed him a, a few times. But he gave me my uh, my initial start. The next guy was Frank Gifford, who got, who got me the audition at Channel 2, which I won. And I was the weekend uh, anchor and the sports reporter for Gifford at Channel 2 at the age of 26. Everything happened after that. That's a good segue, too, because I actually wanted to ask you about that. You work with so many greats on the broadcasting side, too, and Howard Cassell and Frank Gifford are, Frank Gifford are among them. Yes, and you know, uh, Frank Gifford's office at Channel 2 was an amazing place to be at because we were on the same floor over on West 57th Street in the same building. Everything at CBS was in the same building at 524 West 57th. And in his office and on the same floor, there was a, just a flow of, of personalities that would, I mean, you know, the, um, the, the greatest sports names worked at CBS Radio with Frank Gifford. We're talking about Chris Schenkel, uh, Pat Summerall, Wynn Elliott, 
was an extraordinary broadcaster at the time. He taught me about language. He taught me how to use language and vocabulary. Uh, Phil Rizzuto did the radio show from there. Uh, in the cafeteria downstairs and in the hallways, the big Walter Cronkite and, and Mike Wall. It was an amazing building. Uh, this was 1966 to 1970. It was an amazing period when CBS News was at its zenith when CBS was the Tiffany of the networks, uh, you know, and of course at that time was the, the extraordinary reporting the Vietnam War and Walter Cronkite coming back from the Tet Offensive, I believe it was 1968, and, and saying that we can't win. And LBJ uh, did not run for, off, uh, run for the presidency again. He said, if I lost Walter Cronkite, I've lost the country. So it was a, 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 I love going to work every day and going in those doors. How proud are you now about, you know, having your daughter, Sam, kind of carry on in the family business? I know that she's teaching these days, but has long, wa uh, long worked in sports. Yeah, of course, I'm very proud of her. You know, she, she, uh, she started out uh, writing. She was a sports editor at, at Stuyvesant High School and then a sports editor at Columbia. And from there, she went to sports writing. San Francisco Chronicle, the New York Daily News, uh, transitioned into television, the Sports Channel, that which was absorbed by Fox Sports. She ended up with Fox Sports and then wanted to do more with her life than just uh, being a sideline reporter. And so uh, she went into uh, 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 teaching and she's a uh, equal rights advocate. Um, uh, and right now she's uh, now she's doing even more. She's making documentaries very serious documentaries about so social injustice. So I'm very, very proud of her. I'd like to think too that things are starting to maybe get better here when it comes to the pandemic and sports kind of more and more every day getting back on the grid. Now this announcement from the governor here in the state that we're gonna have some fans at the games, it's definitely promising news. Well, I hope so because it's not the New York that I know, that we know, that we cherish. And hopefully, uh, if, if, if we get health-wise, if we get better and we get, get past this pandemic, then uh, life as we knew it will resume. I, I really miss New York. I, uh, I, I was born in Brooklyn and I was, uh, went to school, obviously, in New York. And I, my whole career was in New York. And, uh, and I really yearn for those, uh, for those exciting days. You know, uh, when I got off work at after the late news, everything worthwhile, everybody worthwhile was only a cab ride away. And that, now that's not the case. And I, I feel bad for young people. Like, I got to say, like yourself, that, that you're denied that, the freedom to do that. And hopefully we'll, we'll get better. Well, we miss seeing you on TV, Sal. And you know, it's just so great to talk with you this morning by phone. Two-time Emmy winner Sal Marciano, thanks for joining us, talking some sports and some weather here on BronxNet. Yeah, yeah. Good to talk to you. Thanks very much for taking the time and talking with me. Take care. We built a media network for you. BronxNet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on BronxNet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at BronxNet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. BronxNet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> BronxNet. <laughs>
Please welcome to the show, Alan Bell. Alan, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, Alan, you've been building things up all over the place most of your life. Tell us about it. Give us a little well, history. Well, if you really want to go back, I started in 1973 in the Lindsay administration, working in the housing agency way back then. And wow. I, I actually ran a program where the city would lend money for uh, low-income families to purchase the buildings they used to, they lived in and convert them to uh, low-income co-ops. And uh, a lot of those were done. I also ran something called the Sweat Equity Program, where people actually contributed their own labor um, to reduce the costs of uh, the projects. Yeah. You work with mostly nonprofits, or uh, Well, now I do. I mean, I've had a long career. Um, things took, took their course. Uh, I would a stint on Wall Street and then... Uh, created my own development company in 1986. And yep. uh, been doing, for a long time, did both market rate and affordable housing. Uh, and we were big, big, in fact, I think we were, the uh, did more projects than anyone, uh, affordable home ownership, which was the New York City Housing Partnership Program of the 80s, 90s, um, early 2000s. And uh, we built yep. projects all over the city, uh, affordable new homes, well, one, uh, one and two family and three family homes. What is your role now with b, b Urban? So, you know, I'm one of the principals. And uh, 10 years ago, I left my other company and went into business with my wife. And uh, we are focused on um, building uh, affordable and supportive housing. Um, and I get, we can get into what supportive housing means. And our special focus is on family supportive housing. Uh, 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 housing for... Um, uh, uh, families, children and families where a head of household might have a mental, Ill, mental issue or a substance abuse issue. And our whole focus is on keeping these families together, uh, putting them into new housing where there's on-site uh, support all day uh, for any of the problems that might come up. And uh, we've been doing this now for um, seven, eight years and produced uh, many hundreds of units. Um, men, most of which are, have been in, in partnership with l &M Development Partners, who's our, our partners and our contractor uh, for most of these jobs. Um, yeah, how did that come about, that partnership with the l &M? Oh, be, because uh, Ron Mollis and I used to be competitors uh, in the old partnership program. And so let's we, bring we, it together. Yeah, we yeah. knew each other from meetings. You know, you have meetings to talk about issues. And uh, when I left my other company, um, I just talked to Ron and say, hey, you know, you have a management company and you have a construction company and I can do the, the development work on these jobs. And it was a, it's been a very good marriage, very good marriage, I must say. Um, How has the uh, pandemic uh, interfered with the, uh, the building of these, uh, these projects? Well, fortunately, you know, we were always on the list of essential, essential services. So it didn't slow down the construction. We also were the first people to market and rent up a building in the middle of the pandemic, which was in the middle of last year on Atlantic Avenue in East New York, Brooklyn. Um, no. the, the biggest issue, and, and which we tried to address, one of the big issues is, you know, kids are, are home and they're not going to school. So in all of our buildings, including our buildings in the Bronx, uh, 2700 Jerome Avenue and in East 162nd Street, we've set up uh, facilities in the common area rooms for the kids to uh, remote learn um, with a super, with teacher supervision, and uh, we've set up these rooms so that these kids can have a more serious place to do their learning instead of just sitting in their apartments, where uh, no. you know, there's a tendency to be uh, distracted, let's say, from from what they're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah, uh, Alan, who benefits from um, from the housing developments that you guys uh, put together? Well. Um, a number of people do. I think um, it's an interesting question. It's a good question because, uh, you know, sometimes there's a lot of pushback about building affordable housing and supportive housing in different neighborhoods. And, you know, we've really found that I think this is true. And there's some studies to look at that it really enhances the values to everyone in the surrounding buildings because we, we pride ourselves in building a very attractive product. And you would never yeah. know going by our buildings that these were supportive housing or you know, housing for the very poor, um, they, they really don't look like that. And so for one thing, I think it helps the community at large. Secondly, it helps, uh, all of our buildings are mixed income. And we believe very seriously in mixed income. So some of the incomes are, you know, middle income and for people in the community. Uh, the community, it's a big issue, 
but uh, we've given, you know, 50% community preferences given to the renting up of these buildings. This, this has been attacked by some as not fair, but, um, you know, the, the immediate community gets the benefit of, of half the units going yeah. to them. And uh, again, we address the needs of families in the shelter system uh, with children uh, that have not been able to find a place to live. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. You know, in everything that you do, Alan, you're always going to get some sort of opposition. Well, so there's always that good and bad and yes and no and him and her, the system of duality, you know? Well, I've been around long enough to know that, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on next? What do you, what do you have coming up? Um, well, we just closed on uh, the, this job in Williams Bridge. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, I made, maybe I made a mistake, but I did my, I'm doing my first out of New York City job, which is a historic buildings in downtown Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, oh, okay. very, very tough town, very tough town. And I feel yeah. like... Baltimore looks a little bit like New York did in the 70s and 80s, and it's really a tough time. The crime is a really a big problem, and these are beautiful old buildings that we're going to restore for live work lofts. Yeah. Um, so uh, large. Why do you feel? Why do you feel you made a mistake? Well, I've always preached that real estate's a local business, and you don't even know what you know. Like your Rolodex is in your head, and you know so many people, and when you run into a problem, you know who to call. And I know that in New York and in New York, Locally, it's, yeah. it's in my blood. I can, I can, you can ask me what's on a corner in some location. I can tell you what's on a corner. But so you Baltimore, feel like you're an adult by going outside of New York. Yeah, I don't know that. And I don't know the, I don't know the people. I don't, although I've gotten to know the new mayor down there, but um, it's, it's, a, but anyway, it's a, it'll be a fun project. Uh, anyway. Yeah, you're an expert. You'll, you'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, Everything will come together. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, yeah. Um, where can we go to find more out about you and what you're doing? Well, we have a website, uh, bnburban.com. It shows you both what we're doing recently and uh, in the near, the recent past and also in the far past. And you'll see Bronx, Bronx jobs shown there from years ago that we, we've developed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've done now 50 uh, ground up development projects, not 50 buildings, but 50 projects. I mean, a project uh -huh. might have had you know, 100 houses in it. So I've been doing this a while. Uh, I love it. I love development. I love to see transformation in neighborhoods. I love to see smiling faces of people moving into new homes. Uh, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Um, yeah. For me anyway, not for everybody, but for me. Uh, well, thank you so much, Alan. Thank you for joining and thank you for sharing. It's been wonderful. And uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, you coming back again and sharing more. Anytime, give me a call. I'm available. All right. All right. Thank you so William, much. William Allen Bell, principal of BNB Urban LLC. He's from the East Williamsbridge Gardens Housing Development Project, and uh, he's putting it up. He's building it. Right. Keep building, keep building, Alan. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Okay. Unfortunately, Alan, that's all the time we have for today's show. I want to thank you and our guests for joining us, and you, our viewers, for tuning in and checking it all out. We appreciate you and love you. And always remember this, what you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift to God. So choose your choice. Let your choice control or choose it. And remember, whether you say you can or you can't, either way, you're right. Well, all of us here at Bronx, that have a great and enjoyable day. And uh, I'll see you over 107.5 WBLS. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee. We love you all. Peace.